open our Bibles to Psalm chapter 100. And we're going to look at one verse today. Psalm chapter 100, verse 3. And I'm going to do, I had some images here for you guys, so I'm going to preach and also try to do this thing with the images. Let's see how that works out. <laughs> Um, some of us learn by what we hear, and some of us learn by what we see. And I thought that this sermon, um, fashioned in the secret place. That's where you and me, because that's where we've been fashioned, in a secret place. Amen. And our goal today is that you will be so encouraged. We've been on this creation sermon series. We started on Mother's Day seeing the creation of the Ezra Connecto, of the help meet warrior princesses of God. Amen. 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 Seeing Amen. that and then the following week we stepped into the creation of man and woman and we're hitting some controversial topics. We hit topics on homosexuality, on transgenderism and what is the position of the church. And I hope that your life has been blessed. Amen. I hope that you've been receiving and understanding where we stand because we you've got to stand somewhere. You either stand with them or you and stand against God or you stand with God and against the world. We got to make a decision where we're going to stand. Joshua had to make a decision and he said, as for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. I don't know who you're going to serve. Amen. Even Amen. the prophet he, um, Elijah told the people, he gathered them in a, in a pagan culture. And he even exhorted them. He said, how long will you be in two thought processes. How long will you be double-minded? How long are you going to be in two back and forth? Come, come, come. He called them. He rallied them around the altar. we got to have our altars on fire, people yes. of God. We've got to develop and cultivate a personal altar that's between us and God that we will lift up. Altar is another word for prayer. Individual prayer lives at home. We've got to pray this out, folks. To not have a prayer life is to be absent from the power that comes from God to overcome. Yes. Sometimes we find ourselves, we're defeated. Sometimes we're all jacked up in a mess because our altars have been abandoned. Our altars are not on fire anymore. Elijah called the people and said, come on over here around the altar. He built the altar once again. Amen. And he showed them. And he showed them. He put forth a sacrifice and he was a, it was a competition between the bells of that land against one man. I don't know, I think it was 400 or 800, but maybe 400 priests that were Jezebel's priests. All there cutting themselves up, crying out, and their God was going to, and the God didn't do nothing. But the God that we serve answers. Amen. Because the God that we serve is yes, alive. Lord, because the God that we serve hears yes, our cry. Amen. And as Elijah Amen. cried up to the Lord, and he made one declaration, fire from heaven yes. came down. And fire came and not only ate up that, that altar and, and the sacrifice, but even dried up because there was water. Y'all look, look it up. Yep. Dried up even the water. Tell me that the God that we serve does not answer. He does. Amen. And we've got to return back to that prayer altar. Yes. Because in the culture which we're living today is anti-Christ. The culture of which we're living today is anti-Bible. They have they're filled with everything except the truth. And we gotta be careful who we're hanging around with and who we're listening to. We are to be guided by God and the Holy Spirit, yes, Amen. to be the, the bearers of good news. Amen. Thank but we are to be influencing them, not them to us. Yes. And if that, that starts happening, something's wrong. Thank you, Lord. And we need the power of the Holy Spirit Amen. to be able to get out to this world, to be able to be a testimony. Yes. It's Amen. not so much in word. Apostle Paul said, I don't come to you just in word. I come to you in power. Hallelujah. We need the power yes. from up high. And power only comes when we pray. Amen. So we got to pray. Amen. We've got to be people of prayer, Amen. not just corporately. We've got to have a life out of this where I'm meeting with God on a personal basis. I don't care. Whatever I've got to do, I've got to meet with God. If I've got to say, I'm sorry, I can't meet with you today because my appointment with God is more important than so be it. Nothing should take away our time from God. Amen. Nothing Amen. should take away our time from prayer. 
Amen. You can't tell me I don't have enough time to pray. I'm sorry. I'm going to tell you that I'm sorry. I will not have enough time if I don't pray. Thank you, Lord. Because God gives us time to redeem when we put him first. Amen. Seek first. Y'all know that. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Yes. Yes. Amen. According to Matthew chapter 5. Yes, yes. Amen. 33, I think it is. Verse 33. And all the rest shall be added to you when we put God first. So, folks, we need to learn to put God first. Amen? Amen. But that's not my message today. <laughs> my message today is fashioned in the secret place. Psalms chapter 100, verse 3. I'm going to read in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit of people God say. Amen. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people. See, you, we all have an owner. Now, I don't know about you, but my owner is the one that's made heavens and earth. <laughs> I'm declaring that my, my owner is my yes. Lord Jesus Amen. Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. Amen. Because there's another owner Thank out there. You, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's another master out in the realm of darkness, you, and that's a taskmaster out there. But it is he who has made us and not we ourselves. So, so we have even a designer and a creator. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. That means he's got a pasture for us. That means uh, Psalm 23 uh, tells us that, that the shepherd, the good shepherd, is going to uh, bring us to what? He's going to bring us to rivers of living waters, but then he's going to lay us by what? Green pastures. So he's going to give us to drink, and he's going to give us to eat. Hallelujah. Yeah. And when we look at that spiritually speaking, is we're going to drink from the spirit of God. Samaritan woman was thirsty. She, was, she had to come back to the well and keep filling up her little, uh, what do you call that, frasco, uh, uh, a jar. But she had an encounter with Jesus, the one, the true living waters. Amen. And let me tell you what, when she done had an encounter with Jesus, she dropped what she had and she ran to the community to begin to let everyone know, oh my goodness, the prophet has, I've encountered him. I'm drinking from his water. Thank you. We drink from the Holy Spirit. We drink from Jesus. Amen. But then we Amen. nourish from his word. This is, man will not live by what? Bread alone. I know we all love bread. I don't know. You, we like bread. I'm guilty of it. Pan con mantequilla. Slather up that butter in a freshly baked bread with some cheese and coffee on the side. It's a done deal. But Jesus says, hey, Grisel, you're not going to live by that alone. Amen. Yeah, it will not help you. It'll, it'll satisfy a sensual need. But it will satisfy you spiritually. And we've got to figure this out because there are some things that we're trying to satisfy ourselves with, but they cannot satisfy us. But the only one that can satisfy us is Jesus Christ, the bread of life. Man will not live by bread alone, but by every word. This right here, this precious book. While the world hates this book, we've got to learn to love it. Amen. And we've got to have this ruling our life. Father, I thank you today. I thank you for your sweet presence. I thank you for the anointing of your spirit. Lord, today we receive your word. Our hearts are open. Our ears are trying to listen to the voice of your spirit. Lord, we want to receive all that you have for us. Mark us today. Lord, this word that you have is for us today. Father, you have something to communicate to us. Lord, let this communication come through the anointing, the inspiration of your spirit. I remove myself and I place you, Holy Spirit. The only voice we want to hear today is yours. Amen. Father, Amen. today we give you all the honor, all the glory, and all the praise. I thank you, Father, for you are here. I thank you that we are under open heavens. I thank you, Father, you made everything available to us. We sit at your table today to nourish our souls. Father, not only from your spirit, but from your word. So, Holy Spirit, open the eyes of our understanding. Help us to understand, to receive, and to comprehend, and Lord, that we would eat of this word and that we would harbor it, Lord, and have it, Lord, just engrafted in us, Lord. Father God, and seal it with the blood of the Lamb and that it will come to produce righteousness, right living yes. in the name of Jesus. Cause us to know you much more better, Lord, and that we will continue to grow, Father, and cultivate the fruit of your spirit, maturing, Lord, and entering into another realm of maturity, being deeply rooted in your knowledge of who Jesus is. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen, amen. 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 Go ahead and take a seat, amen.
fashioned in the secret place. As you see, I've had my PowerPoint up, and I have some images I want to share with you because I think the images impact us as well. Uh, you know, they say a, a picture is a thousand words, right? So I've got some pictures here as we're going to go through um, as I continue. And today, I just want to bring you a short, sweet sermon, not too long, just want to give you guys some information as we've been on this uh, creation sermon series. How many have been enjoying that, that series? Amen. Have you been learning something about it? Amen. And so we've been on this creation sermon series. We began on Mother's Day talking about when God made Adam his help meet as her connecto. And then last week we talked about when God created man and woman. Today we delve even further to talk about his creation with the unborn. Those that are created in the secret place those created in the mother's womb. We have seen through scripture how the divine Godhead made an eternal executive decision to make man in his image and in his likeness. We learned last week that we all have been created in God's image. We're all image bearers. Amen. We have the image of the almighty God imprinted in us. Whether you want to receive it or not, it doesn't matter. It's in you nonetheless. The Imago Day is what we carry, every one of us. It's what the unborn carries. Him who God loves. So wherever you find yourself, know that him who God loves is with you. Hallelujah. Yeah. It doesn't matter if the world rejects you. Know that the Imago Day in you says him who God loves. So as long as you got God's love, it doesn't matter. Amen. Hello? As long as I got God's love, I could care less about nobody else. Because, hey, Amen. I'm in connection with my divine creator. That's something. Amen. That's something. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so he creates man out of dust, and he forms Adam. Then God not only left the dummy, that inanimate object like that, he gave him life. And he breathed in his nostrils, and breath, the breath of God came through to life what was inanimate in this dummy and made him a living being. A tripart man with a spirit, with a soul, and a body, with the capacity to think, to experience emotions, a will to make decisions, and a spirit to commune with his creator. But out of Adam, God architecturally designed Eve, a helpmeet, as I said before, in Ezra Connecto, a warrior princess from out of Adam's rib. He took one rib, he took some of Adam's flesh, and out of Adam came a princess warrior. But God didn't just leave them like that, he gave them purpose. Say purpose. 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 God always gives purpose to what he's creating. You have purpose. You have to understand that. That's why we're not here to just warm up a seat. We're not here just to be an inanimate object. We need the spirit of God to be breathed in us, to bring us alive, spiritually speaking, because we have purpose and destiny to get to. Tell your neighbor, that's for you. That's for you. And so he placed them into an ecosystem that he designed called Eden. And they were there with purpose to tend, to keep the garden. They were to have dominion. God gave them dominion. God gave them authority. God gave them stewardship over the air, over the land, over the sea. And they were supposed to be fruitful. <laughs> they were supposed to multiply. And they were told, fill the earth. And we're serving a God who multiplies. And the only time that God comes to take away is to make room for something greater in our life. Hello? Amen. When God has to, John 15, 5, uh, John 15 talks about that he's a vine dresser. God is a vine dresser. And, and, and so Jesus is a vine, and we are the branches. And so as long as the branches stay connected to the vine, they come to produce fruit. But wait, the vine dresser comes in seasons to prune us. The Bible says he comes in seasons to take things out of our life. 
If those seasons don't feel good, hello? Mm -hmm. We'll be like, ugh, really God, really about God. And especially if we're like, we got that hoarder type spirit. Okay. We're like, no, you can't take this, Lord. I need this down the road. And the battle to separate ourselves, because that's what sanctification is. God has called us out, and we heard his voice because we're here today. Amen. We heard his voice. My sheep know my voice. They follow me. We heard the call. We responded to the call, and that's why you're here today. But it's not just coming here to sit and just do a little job here. No, there's more to it. God said, I'm going to sanctify you. I'm going to consecrate you. Mean, I'm going to separate you for a specific work because you have purpose. That means I gotta cleanse you up. And that's the beauty of God that when we come to Him, He loves us just as we are. But He says, I love you so much, I'm not gonna leave you the way you are. I'm gonna to restore to you, I'm gonna renew yes. you, I'm gonna do a sanctifying work in your life. There's a consecrating area, and that's where a lot of people can't make it. God is trying to bring us through a process of cleansing out things in our life, renewing our thoughts, changing us so we have the character of Christ so that we can be effective in our purpose. Hallelujah. Amen. So that whatever we do, we don't boast in ourselves, but God gets the glory. Amen. And so we see that God, whenever he has to prune, it's because there's more coming. Tell your neighbor, more is coming. More is coming. So when I'm, I'm experiencing a lot of loss in my life, then I get to rejoice. That's what James said. Rejoice when you find yourself in diverse temptations and trials and adversity. Count it on joy. Right, Pastor Dan? Count it on joy because God is doing a great work, an eternal work of removing things, getting the weeds out, getting the stuff that doesn't benefit us, Amen. getting the stuff that only limits us, Amen. and releasing us, Thank increasing our capacity to receive more Amen. of God. Amen. We gotta be empty of ourselves. Yes. We're too filled with ourselves, filled with our passions and our ideas. Amen. God says, I gotta change all that. So he takes us like Esther. Mm. I'm gonna take you to get beautified. I'm gonna take you to the perfume a season. I'm gonna take you, and myrrh was one of those perfumes that she had to be placed on her. And myrrh is anything but crushing. It's, it's a perfume that comes to, really, you're gonna feel the pressing. You're gonna feel like, oh my God, I'm gonna die in this. But I'm sorry, you're not gonna die. Because what God says is, you shall not die. You shall live. That is the promise of God to our lives. You just think you are, but you're not. I'm gonna bring you out of this. And when I bring you out of this, you're gonna be beautiful to my eyes not to the world's beautiful inwardly not outside because we can put all sorts of makeup and look pretty outside and be ugly inside mm -hmm. come on come on we can uh, we can make it look like oh we're all got it all together but inside God sees that we're decrepit Amen. that's what Jesus said to the Pharisees you know y'all are a bunch of whitewashed tombs on the outside you look holy you look priestly but you're dead inside you're hypocritical inside you're religious inside I've got to change that. Thank so I you, thank Lord. God. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, we serve thank the God who is always you, telling us, I want you to be like me. I am fruitful. I do multiply. I and I do God. fill yes. what is vacant. I want you to be the same way. Hallelujah. So he sent Adam and Eve. Go do that job. And he calls us to do the same. So that God called. God makes Adam. And out of Adam he designed Eve. And now out of Eve they're going to arrive a new generation of little people. <laughs> a new generation of little people. It's the byproduct of both male and female. As God specifically designed males to be the seed carrier, but also donors of that seed. And where does that seed go? Well, they give their genetic makeup to a female. Their wife, who will be the receptor of that information. And once the male seed that has all the genetic DNA coalesces with the female's ovum, which also has another partial part of genetic DNA, conception occurs. This is exactly what happened when the angel visited Mary and said, Mary, made servant of God, that she was the chosen one. Hey, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you. The Holy Spirit is going to overshadow you. And, 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 and 
you're going to conceive what is going to be in you comes from above. And I'm paraphrasing. What is going to be in you is supernatural. And she said, let, let God do whatever he wants to do with my life. Let it be so. The Holy Spirit came upon Eve. And he, he deposited in Eve a divine seed. He deposited in her spiritual womb. In her womb, he deposited a seed called Jesus Christ. Uh, he was a uh, God and he was man. And, and he was the one that's going to be carried through the nine months, given birth, raised, and he will be the one in future to give his life for humanity. Amen. We need seed in order for us to birth. That's why when I take it from the natural to the spiritual realm, we need the seed of God's word implanted in our spiritual womb. And we need the Holy Spirit to yes. take that word and begin to illuminate it, begin to help us understand and begin to work in Thank us Lord. a greater Thank work you. that we can't do on our own. Oh my goodness, we cannot remain the same. Amen. When we receive that seed from God's word, it comes to produce life. Amen. The seed of God's word produces life in us. Thank you, Lord. And so here we see that King David, King David states here an absolute truth in Psalms chapter 100, verse 3. Know that the Lord, he is God. He is God. Know that the Lord, he is God. He is the creator of heaven and earth. He is the God of Abraham. He is the God of Isaac. He is the God of Jacob. He is the Alpha and he is the Omega. He is the beginning and he is the end. Amen. There is no one like him. There is no yes. one like him. He is the I Am. He is the great power. His name is great and greatly to be praised. Yes. He is the one who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand. He measured heaven with a span and calculated the dust of the earth in a measure. He weighs the mountains in scales and the hills in balance. Know that the Lord, he is God. Is he your God? Say amen. Yes. amen. amen. And it is he, it is he who made us. We sure didn't make ourselves. We didn't just come out of a clump of cells. I'm sorry. Uh-uh. I have a creator. Amen. He made me. Y'all don't like me? Talk to him. <laughs> <laughs> sorry. He made me. Just like he made you. Thank you, man. God's hand was not only involved at the beginning of creation with Adam and Eve, but daily continues to be intimately engaged in conception in every human being. It is God who made you and made me. God is ever present at the time of conception. That doesn't change ever. Never changes. When, while scientists scramble to find theories and evidence to provide a scientific reason for the miracle of life, what is right before their face is undeniable and proof that only a higher being with higher intelligence does exist, and it's not an alien. <laughs> it's God Almighty. Amen. It's God Almighty. According to an article by Science Alert in 2016, a study by Northwestern University, they found for the first time ever, scientists have captured images of the flash of light that sparks at the very moment a human sperm makes contact with an egg. <laughs> Spark. This phenomenon has been observed in animals before, but no one's ever seen the spark of human conception. And what is most incredible is that some eggs burn brighter than others, which is a direct indication of their ability to develop into a healthy embryo. This spark is what they are using to determine the viability of an individual egg. Scientifically, they explain that when the sperm enters the egg, it triggers calcium to be increased, which releases zinc from the egg, and zinc shoots out and it causes a spark. While the scientist attributes the spark to calcium and zinc atoms, these minerals do not make life. They are not the ones that make life. Scripture tells me that God is light, and that he is the father of light. Amen. We find in Genesis 
Genesis chapter 1, God speaks and said, let there be light. And the Holy Spirit supernaturally brings into existence God's word. This amazing discovery triple, triples amplifies to me that it is God who, who begins each life and man has no business of taking it. I'm going to have a lot of scripture for you. Psalm chapter 139, verses 13 through 15. I'm using the message translation. Oh, yes. You shaped me first inside, then out. You formed me in my mother's womb. I thank you. Hi, God. You are breathtaking. Thank you, Lord. Body and soul, I am marvelously made. When did you look in the mirror, laugh, and say, you are marvelously and fearfully made? Amen. Oh, you're lovely. Oh, you're so fat. Oh, my God. We always cutting ourselves down. When do we start speaking life to ourselves? Amen. When do we yes. start speaking the life of God and, and, and giving God the glory for who he made? Not yes. that I'm just trying to boast yourself. You know, it's good to have some good stuff. It's like, oh, you look good today. You know, but you know, God, I give you the glory. Look what you made. I'm not a mistake. Amen. Come on. And so here the, psalm, the psalmist is saying, I thank you, high God. You're breathtaking. Body and soul, I am marvelously made. I worship in adoration. What a creation. You know me inside and you know me out. You know every bone in my body. You know exactly how I was made bit by bit. How I was sculpted from nothing into something. Like an open book, you watch me grow from conception to birth. All the stages of my life were spread out before you. The days of my life all prepared before I even lived one day. That's the God that we serve. Amen. That's the God that knows us. At the moment of conception, the baby's gender, hair, and eye color already determined. The baby's heart begins to beat just 20 day, 21 days after conception. One week later, the basic structure for his or her brain and spinal cord has already formed. Just six weeks after conception, elbows and fingers take shape. Tooth buds, imagine that. Hey, tooth buds already? For baby teeth already growing and the baby's eyelids are beginning to form. It is God who is present in conception. It is God who is shaping. It is God who is forming each one of us first in the inside, Amen. then in the outside. Amen. In the womb, the secret hidden place is where God is working for the nine months, fashioning all of us. The Bible says we are his workmanship. We are created in Christ for what? Good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them beforehand wait a minute god you 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 prepared what beforehand what are you talking about let's see bible jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 before the foundations of the world it was god who chose us in christ before the foundations of the world that we should be what holy and without blame before him in love. So we see according to Ephesians chapter 1, 4 and Jeremiah chapter 1, 5, we see that we, before the foundations of the world, we already were in the mind of God. Amen. I don't know what that, I don't know what that does to you, but I, I'm like, wow. You and I were in the mind of God. Imagine that. This is too great knowledge for us to comprehend. That's why we don't even know what to say to that. That's all I could say. God has perfect knowledge of everything that has to do with you and me. He even knows the number of the hairs on your head. Mm -hmm. So when hair follicle number 3,526 falls out, God knows. When hair number 25,387 turns white, he knows. He knows. He is acquainted with all of our ways. We can't surprise him. We can't shock him with anything about ourselves, for he knows what is inside and what is outside. Thank you, Lord Jesus. 
It was our almighty God who made and fashioned us in our mother's womb. He is our creator. Is he your creator? Yes. yes. And we originate from him. We don't originate from a monkey. We don't originate, according to Darwin, who suggests his theory of mankind's evolution, man comes from monkey. I sure don't. I don't know about you, but I remember when I was in middle school in biology class, and my instructor was talking about Darwin's theory, and he was talking about that we man comes from the, the monkey and all that, and I raised my hand from where I was sitting, and I was like, I'm sorry, I disagree with you, because I don't come from a monkey. God made me. The Bible says God made me. That man didn't know what to say to me. He just continued talking and ignored me. But I want to make sure I'm coming to agreement with your, what you're Amen. teaching. I know where I'm founded at. I'm founded in, in the word of God that God created me. Hello? Amen. <laughs> Job 31, 15 says, Did not he who made me in the womb make them? Did not the same one fashion us in the womb? Job chapter 10, verse 8 through 9. Your hands have made me and fashioned me intricately in unity. Yet you would destroy me. Remember, I pray that you have made me like clay and you will turn me into dust again because that's where we end up. From dust I came, from dust I shall return. The Spirit of God goes back to God. But where will our soul go? We got to make sure we've got that insurance, eternal insurance on our soul. That is going to go straight to paradise. Just when Jesus was there with the two thieves, one of them chose not to believe, and the other one says, forgive me, oh, I believe in you. He says, today you shall be with me in paradise. I don't know about you, I want to hear the words, uh, great and faithful servant, and the, you were faithful in the small. Come on in now to your reward. Uh, I want to enter the pearly gates. I'll be like, hallelujah. This time I'm not being rejected. They're not sending me through the stairs again and sending me back. Oh, I'm being received in the name of Jesus. Welcome to paradise. I'm like, this is where the party begins. <laughs> We've been fashioned in the womb of our mother. The Oxford Dictionary defines it as style of dress an ornament or manners of behavior. I start thinking about this. And, and fashion today in the world, the secular world is all about Versace. Uh -huh. It's all about Prada and Vogue, Gucci, Target, Walmart, Macy's, Lord and Taylor. That, that's, the, that's the fashion that the world has. And in terms of behavior, you'll sometimes, oh man, that person's old fashioned. Like the old, Hey, you got to get into the new fashion, the new trend. We got to be careful with the fashions that are yes. out around yes. us. That's true. Because even in the fashions, they're antichrist. Yes. They're diabolical. Be careful. Delight of spirit all over the yep. place. Come on. You can show flesh. You can show this and that. Uh-uh. We got to be fashioned by God's word. We got to have that in us. Amen. And so fashioning means to make a particular, to make particular or uh, the required form. To make particular... So if you're making something particular, it's got to be different from the whole. If you're making something unique, it cannot be like the others. So you can tell yourself, I'm not a robot. I'm not a robot. I'm, like, I'm not like them. I'm uniquely and fearfully, wonderfully made by my creator. I have my own fingerprint. No one has my fingerprint. No one in this world. They might. I might have a doppelganger, but they ain't like me. Sorry. I got my own personality, I got my own spirit, and I got my own fingerprint. Yeah, yep. You can try to look like me, but you're not me. Yeah. Because I'm uniquely made, made by him, by my creator. Yeah. And I come with purpose. So get out of my way. Because I got to find out with my creator, what is that purpose? What do you got me here for? I got to get going on it because life is short. When my life, when I compare it to eternity, it's but just a small vapor. At the yeah. moment it is here, and then it is gone. Yes. What are you going to do with your life? Do it and live for yourself or live for God? It's up to you. In Hebrew, fashion means to design, to pattern, to mold, to manufacture after. We find this in Genesis chapter 1, verse 27. For it states that we were created and fashioned in the image, the imago Dei, and likeness of our creator. Psalms chapter 139, verse 14 tells us we have been fearfully and wonderfully made. We have been fearfully and wonderfully made. But what does that mean? But what does it really mean? The 
word wonderfully in Hebrew is pala, which means to separate, to be distinguished or unique. Basically, it means that God made you and God made me to be special. He made us to be unique, different from the world, special. Have you ever looked in the mirror and told yourself that you are average, inadequate, or not enough? What are you speaking when you look in the mirror? Let's make sure we speak words of life. Because if we're speaking words that don't coincide with how God created us to be, then we're not seeing ourselves the way God sees us. We're not seeing ourselves the way God sees us. And we need to have God's perspective and speak according to God's perspective. Amen? Amen. Amen. There's no one else like you. Tell your neighbor, ain't nobody, nobody else, else like you. Like you. Nobody, nobody else like you. Nobody else like Bells. Like so, mm -hmm. so be afraid. Be afraid. Be very afraid. <laughs> you are the only you there is in this entire globe. Only you imagine that. There's no one else. Universe. They can make it a clone, but they're not you. God made you special. God made you distinguished. God made Amen. you unique. And when we're talking about fearfully, made us wonderful, fearfully and wonderfully made, fearfully refers to a deep respect and reverence for God. That's in us. That's in us. We follow God and obey God because we respect his ways, because we love him, and because who he is. We're not chasing after him for blessings. We're not using him as a bank. Give me this, give me this, give me this. And then we're not really wanting a relationship with him. We desire every human being has a God capacity in them because the image of God is in them. There is a void in every man. That void can only be filled by God Almighty, by his presence. He, he literally built us that way. Why? Because we have been built, we have been created in fashion and form to what? Fearfully praise him, fearfully honor him, fearfully exalt him, to worship him. We've been created to worship God. And we stand in awe of how great and mighty our God is, and we come to him in praise because he is worthy Amen. of our praise. Amen. David you, is saying, Lord, how great is your work, except your work is me. <laughs> your work is me. Therefore, how great am I? However, I'm not only great because it's your greatness in me that makes me great. <laughs> you're great, Lord, because you make me great, but I'm great only because you're great. How about that? In the same way, I'm only wonderful because God's wonderfulness makes us wonderful. Hallelujah. God's divine presence is so intimate that even in the mother's womb, he carefully knits us together. It is God knitting us together. I don't know if you've ever knitted before. I, I tried one time. I said, this is not for me. That's not my gift. I don't have an anointing for that. I don't. My hands were not made for having two needles and trying to do that because the, the person that, that was knitting was trying to teach me. She made it look easy. You know, I'm like, oh, I can do that. Let me see. So you have to hold your fingers straight. You have to hold the one needle with this hand and then the needle with this, but then the string, the yarn is connected to this finger. And, and let me see how I can do this. I need both my hands, I gotta get that wireless mic. So, so she, I had the two needles, and this finger has to stay straight all the time, taut, because it's carrying the yarn, okay? Because this finger holds the yarn, and at the same time, the two needles go. And while I try to focus so much on the needles, my finger would go <laughs> And all the yarn would fall off. And I was like, oh my goodness. And she goes, honey, you have to hold your finger and just keep holding it. I'm like, I know, but it's every time I come to do this, this goes down. <laughs> and I try over and over. I got so frustrated, like, this piece of crap. I'm like, this is my this is, I can't do this. But imagine God in his infinite wisdom and love taking and he's knitting us together in a place that no one else can see in the womb of a mother god himself is present there within the womb imagine god you're so great you're so i mean but you making you make yourself little enough to be within us you're human beings i can't, I can't fathom that 
You are great and mighty. You're living in the third heaven. But yet, because of your love for your creation, you're willing to be a part of them. You give them their image. You give them, you give them your image, but then on top of it, when it's time to create, you've given the woman capacity to carry a, a, an unborn for nine months, and you're in there knitting away a human being. Imagine that. God himself forms and fashions us fearfully and wonderfully. God knows every minute detail and precise knowledge of our lives down to the very nanosecond we will be born. He knows when, how we will live and when we shall die. Know that we shall die. We are born, and as the minute that we're born, just know that there's a day set for death. That's just how it is. We are the sheep of his pasture. We are esteemed and valuable to God. For what? We are his creation. You're not a mistake. I'm not a mistake. Amen. We are God's creation. And some mothers might say, I made a mistake. No. The life, God placed it there. There's purpose in that life. And we tend to focus on the negative so much. And we focus on the mistakes. And we focus on all the other stuff instead of focusing on what God is doing at that particular moment. Isaiah 59, 14 tells us, even if a woman, check this out, I, this is amazing. I said, wow, Lord. Even if a woman would forget her nursing child, that she would have no compassion for the babe of her womb, and even if she forgets her child, God will never forget us. Wow, God will never forget us. Not only is he present in utero, he's present when we come out. He's present when we're abandoned. He's present when, when, when whoever stepped out on us, he, he's there with us. He's our eternal father. Amen. He said, I will never leave you Thank nor you, abandon Lord. you. Oh, that gives me comfort. That Thank just you, makes Lord. me excited. I'm like, Lord, Jesus. thank you. Thank you because then that, that, I got to tell the devil, get out of my, get out of my face. You're coming over here with your lies. My father's Amen. been with me. Oh. I've been, I've been in his mind even before the foundations of the world. So get out of here. The Lord ordains everything from eternity past to eternity future and everything in between. <laughs> past, present, and future. God's got it all. It is because all humanity is fearfully and wonderfully made that life is sacred. Life is sacred. It is because all humanity, humanity is fearfully and wonderfully made that humanity is the pinnacle of creation, created to resemble God and to fill the earth through procreation with fellow image bearers of God. Procreation can only happen between a male and a female. That is how God has ordained it, that is God has established it. Man, no matter what they try to change, that cannot go from, they cannot, they cannot derive from that initial establishment that God has already implemented in the garden of Eden with Adam and Eve, that, that procreation can only happen through male and female. Amen. So much crap you see out there, so much disgusting filth on TV and social media that two males come together and all of a sudden one of them decides to become a female and somehow, uh, or two females, uh, one of them becomes a male and then one of them is becoming pregnant and then they're like, oh, the male is pregnant. No, it's because she's a female. She's not a male. She's a female. She's been given the capacity to give birth. Don't try to twist things and pervert things because that's what the devil does. Trying to find a way, even, uh, I'm not going to go there, it was too much for the message, with eugenics. We find scientists trying to play God and trying to see if they're able to create a human being in a pod. So they can say, oh, we, we are God. Tell me how science has perverted. We're thankful for science, but science needs to recognize their God, God in heaven. It is because humanity is loved by God and made in the image of God that we must contend for life. We've got to fight for the life of all, especially of those in the womb. We not only fight for the life of those on, on, um, on death row, we've got to fight for the life of everyone. Every life is precious because every life has the image of God in them. And even the ones in utero, Today we have a, such a war happening at, at Capitol Hill at, at the Supreme Court Justice because of what is inside of a woman. That's not real. That's not a lie. That's a blob. That I can do whatever I want with it because it's my body. 
when in fact it is God who has made us and we're not a property of ourselves. We are property of the yes. God who created us. So what is in me is also his property. Amen. I'll get there in just a bit. God makes selection, separation, and calling from the womb. God makes selection, separation, and calling from the womb. From the mother's womb. Ha! A place that no one can see. Yes, we've got sonogram now. But you still cannot see what is happening in the womb. We thank God for scientists who was able to uh, use pregnant women and are able to put in, insert cameras and, and we can see a video of life from beginning, conception to end, you know, and see, but we still do not have a <coughs> defined uh, 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 information of the particulars. Only God knows that. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 4 through 5. We see that God calls Jeremiah. There's a calling on his life. He says that the word of the Lord came to me saying, before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. I want to tell you today, man and woman of God, before you were formed in your mama's womb, God already knew you. God knew you already. You were in God's mind. I know you can't understand. That's too much for us to comprehend. But believe you me, we were in his mind already before we were planted in our mother's Amen. womb. And the fact that we were planted in our mother's womb, then that's not a mistake either. Or oh, I came to the wrong family. That's not, that's not a mistake. God has established that. God placed you specifically in that family for whatever reason, according to your purpose. You just don't have that understanding right now. Oftentimes, we're so because of rejection, because of, of, of being isolated or mistreated, abused from our own family. Oh my God, how can that be? This cannot be. Lord, you made a mistake. God don't make mistakes. Amen. God doesn't make Amen. mistakes. Amen. What we have to, Thank what we've gone through is what called sin. What we're experiencing is a consequence of sin that runs in, even in our genealogy. It runs within our familial lines. And we've got to recognize that. But let me tell you that. God makes no mistakes. So we, he planted us exactly where we needed to be. I'm not who I am today because I, that, that's how God created me. He allowed me to go through a lot of stuff. To, to now, that was kind of like a repertoire that today now is a platform that he uses. My past doesn't define me. My past is simply the story where God shows where now it's a narrative that I can use to help others and say, I used to be there before, and God can take you out. If he took me out, he'll take you out. So God will make mistakes. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I sanctified you. I already chose Thank you. He said, I ordain you a prophet to the nations. Imagine that in utero, God is so present that even creating a call to some child unborn, there's a purpose with it, that unborn child. There is a, a, a call for God in that unborn child. Uh, in this case, it was Jeremiah. I'm ordaining you to be a prophet to the nations. I'm ordaining you. What? How many times God is ordaining wombs and the wombs are, are, are found to destroy Destroy the very life that is in them. How God is, is ordaining and making cause specifically for his kingdom in the wombs of mothers. And because of a lack of understanding and the people perishing because of spiritual idolatry and idolatry in general. The bloodshed that is happening before the presence of God. Thank you. Galatians chapter 1 verse 15 through 17. Apostle Paul was separated and called from the womb of his mother. What that killer? <laughs> that's, that, that's who he was before the grace of God reached him. <laughs> but when it was pleased, but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb and called me through his grace, hello, to reveal his son in me that I may preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood because what is spiritual must confer with the spiritual. You can't try to come with a natural mind to understand the things of the spirit. But, a, but, a, but Apostle Paul said, I was separate, separated from my mom's womb. We, all of us here have been separated from our mother's womb. You're not a mistake. You have got purpose. You have got value. There's a destiny that God wants to take you to. You're in the process where God is separating you. He's still consecrating. He's got to sanctify. He's got to grow us and mature us. Amen? Luke 1.15 John the Baptist was also called. He was also separated and even anointed in the womb. It says, for 
He will be a great, he will be great in the sight of the Lord and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. So he's coming with a Nazarite um, vow. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit even from his mother's womb. And it was fulfilled when Mary went to visit Elizabeth. Here's Mary too. She got her little womb, you know, her little package here with Jesus. And here's here's Elizabeth that they both hug. And the Bible says that that John, um, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, but also the, the unborn baby, John the Baptist, was also filled with the Holy Spirit for Elizabeth's, uh, there was such a stirring within her womb. And, and it was that John the Baptist was already recognizing what Mary was carrying in her womb was the Messiah, was Jesus Christ! Hallelujah! Oh my goodness, so see things happen within the womb. That's why, you know, don't take for granted, oh, I'm just pregnant, no. Oh my goodness, what does God have? What purpose? That's why when we, God gives us the opportunity, I know some of us may not have, we know we, we got spiritual wounds, but some of us may have an opportunity down the road to get married and then to have children. I know some of us are like, that's not for me, Pastor Chris. We get married with our wives and we have a little, a little Isaiah with a bunch of hair, right? <laughs> And his wife is carrying and Isaiah is covering that baby and praying and saying, okay. I'm declaring the yes. word of God over you that Amen. you shall be a prophet to the I nation. Do, You're separated and anointed from the womb. Amen. Imagine that baby be like, hallelujah. <laughs> <laughs> hallelujah. And that's why the enemy attacks even in utero. That's why the enemy attacks. Sometimes the mother is in a violent relationship and she's being physically abused. And through that connection, the inborn child is receiving that. Sometimes the mother is experiencing depression and that depression is infusing into the child. So the enemy of the souls is after our children, after our in utero unborn babies. And we've got to pray over the unborn as well. Luke 141, that's the part where I was talking to you about, and it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary, that the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. Isaiah 49, 5 says, and now the Lord says, who formed me from the womb to be his servant? So some of us don't even, we're not even aware of it, but God has already ordained us to serve him. There's purpose in us. But I'm telling you today, so be aware. Now you can't leave saying, well, I didn't know it. No, now you know. God has already been present in your life since you were in utero. To anoint you, to ordain you, to separate you so we can be his servants. God is the giver of life and the one who maintains life. God is the giver of life and the one who maintains life. I'm going to say it again. God is the giver of life and the one who maintains Amen. life. He has appropriated the time that each of us will enter into this world and when we will depart from the earth. But there is one, we rebuke him in the name of Jesus, who hates humanity. He hates God's creation and everything that has to do with life. Did you hear me, people of God? His only mission is to kill, to steal, and destroy. So he's devised a plan to kill the fruit of the womb while it is still vulnerable let's make two distinctions here so we can see that God stands for life Satan we rebuke you in the name of Jesus he stands for death God stands for life Satan stands for death am I clear on that yes. John 10 10 the thief does not come except to do three things steal kill and destroy but Jesus said, but I have come huh, so that you may have life and have it more abundantly. Amen. God is for life. Satan is for death. Amen. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, for I know the thoughts I think toward you, say the Lord. Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. That's my God. Amen. James 1, 17 
every good gift. See, I got to go back to Bible and make sure you understand the declarations yes. and the decrees of the word of God. So we stand on the word and not be um, uh, beguiled by what is moving around us. And we come into agreement with the evil and death because that's not of God. James 1.17 says every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and comes down from the father of what? Of darkness? No. From the father of lights within whom there is no variation or shadow of turning. And finally, I'm going to give you one more verse just in case you weren't totally convinced. Just in case. Just in case. Psalm 127, verse 3 to 5. Behold, children are a heritage from the Lord. They are a blessing. Children are a blessing. Those that are in, they come from the in utero realm. They are a blessing. Children are a heritage from the Lord. The fruit of the womb is a reward. Many mothers don't have the ability to give birth, so they adopt, they foster. But when we have been given the privilege of being able to give birth, know that this is the fruit of the womb. It is a reward. Like arrows in the hands of a warrior, so are the children of one's youth. Happy is the man who has a quiver of them. So Isaiah, I bless you to have a quiver of, of them. Not to make a soccer team, but to make a team for God's kingdom. A preacher to go out and preach evangelists and prophets. And apostles establish the kingdom of God in the name of Jesus. Yes. yes. Happy is the man who has a quiver of them. May you, my dear Teffy, have a quiver of them. Amen. If not ten, five at least. <laughs> five is the number of grace. Hallelujah. Yeah. <laughs> have a quiver of them. They shall not be ashamed, but shall speak with their enemies in the gate. My goodness, what is the price of freedom here in America? I forgot. Noeli. May God give you a quiver of them. Seven, the number of completion. Seven <laughs> children. Hallelujah. And may they come in sets. Twins. Hallelujah. So that way you just have to give birth. Let me see. Two, four, six, four times. Hallelujah. <laughs> the name of Jesus. What is the price of freedom in America? What is that price? It's called child sacrifice. It's called child sacrifice. The idea of a child sacrifice evokes primal horror in believers and skeptics alike. We like to think of the practice as an abhorrent relic of long forgotten past. But America continues to practice child sacrifice. These sacrifices are labeled as pro-choice. My body, my choice, my right. When in fact at the root of this choice is to worship the pagan god of Molech. Did you hear me? It's to worship the pagan god of Molech. The worship of Molech is an ancient, ancient Near Eastern pagan deity to whom children were offered. On an account of child sacrifice, the Hebrew Bible depicts Molech as a particular barbaric form of idolatry. Did you hear me? A barbaric form of idolatry. Many believe that the worship to Molech has ceased when in fact it continues strong in our nation, in the United States of America. The connection between idolatry and child sacrifice offers us a helpful test to discern between worship of the true God and worship to the false God. If a child, if child sacrifice is required, then what we worship is not God, but an idol. Theologians differentiate true worship from false worship by insisting that the true God demands justice and mercy and never blood sacrifice. We see that with Abraham. Why did Abraham know that God would provide somehow another form instead of his son because Abraham understood that God did not want to kill his son. It was a test. And he still trusted God to the very end when the angel finally held his hand and said, no, look upon, there's a ram in the bushes for sacrifice. 
But he was still willing to show God, I love you more than I love my son. But, but Abraham understood who he was serving. The God that I serve doesn't want to kill my child. And one of the things throughout the Old Testament we see is that God was after Israel to remain pure, to remain separated. Don't contaminate yourself with the pagan gods because the Canaanite nations, because the, all the other uh, nations, what they do is they put their children and offer them to Molech. They sacrifice their children. They put their children through the fire. I don't believe that. I don't agree with it. I'm the God of life. So therefore, stay away, separated. Stay away. Stay holy for me. Amen. But what do they want to do? They want to be like the other people. They want to be like the other nations. And they got intermixed and they contaminated themselves that they themselves abandoned truth to, fall, to go after what was false and began practicing and killing their children. The only one who demands blood sacrifices is Satan. And I'm going to tell you what. When you start getting into the occult, when you start meddling with the powers of darkness, the people are deceived because they believe this power feels good. I can do great things. I can do harm. But they don't understand they're going into greater depths of bondage and captivity. Not only that, but they themselves are tormented by demons because if they don't obey those demons, the demons come and literally beat them. They will strip them from their bed. They will hit them against the wall. They will, they will abuse of them if they don't obey those demons. And now they can't get out of it because it's a covenant. But the thing is that the deeper that you uh, uh, get into the occult, you get to a point where you're sacrificing animals for every sacrifice, there has to be blood. For every sacrifice, an altar, there's got to be blood. That's why when we come to the altar of Jesus Christ, we don't offer blood. We offer our lives as a living sacrifice, but we call on the blood of Jesus Christ, the yes. perfect blood of the Lamb, who died once and for all for humanity's sake. It is the blood that Jesus Christ gave for us that God the Father recognizes. It is the blood of Jesus that covers us and cleanses us of all of our sins and iniquity. It is the blood of Jesus who justifies you and me. And when we come to the altar, we plead the blood of Jesus. We plead the name of Jesus. And we have access to the throne by the blood of the Lamb. So the occults and the witches and the sorcerers and those that deal with voodoo and santeria and all that stuff, they, they have to offer a sacrifice of blood. Because see, when you open an altar, you're invoking a spirit. When you open an altar, you're invoking a demon or you're invoking the presence of God. What altar are we opening up to? May God help us not to have spiritual idolatry in our life. May God help us to not have any idolatry. Because what idolatry is, is the worship of demons. And when we worship idols, we are literally invoking demons to come to be a part of our life. So we got to cleanse ourselves up. We cleanse ourselves with the word of God. We cleanse ourselves by humbling ourselves to God and saying, Lord, check me out. Examine my heart. Examine my life. Do I have anything in my home that is anathema to you? Anything that is a curse to you? Show it to me so I may purge myself from it. Is there a something I'm watching? Is there someone I'm with that is a curse? Show me so I may separate myself from it. It's, this is real stuff, folks. Amen. This is real stuff. It's happening today. And people perish for lack of knowledge. They're ignorant. We can't be ignorant. We need the word of God. And they'll offer a little rooster. They'll offer a little chicken. Then they increase in power and then they grow. Now I'm going to offer you a ram. I'm going to offer you a lamb. I'm going to offer you to the point of I want so much power. I'm willing to bring you an unborn child, an a, a infant, to kill the infant so I gain master power. How many infants are being sacrificed? Why do you think that October is the month? Where you have most, where you're, you're like, you know, at Walmart, you go and you look, missing, 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 missing. People are missing. Most of them are children, especially in the month of October. Why? Because October is the month where all the witches, that's their holy, that's like us, Resurrection Sunday, that week, Holy Week. Holy Week. Hello, come on. Mm -hmm. Holy Week is a, it's a week of recognizing the death, the, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Well, well, in October is the month 
And October 31st is the day they celebrate. And that is when they've done their job of kidnapping all sorts of kids. Why? To offer them as a sacrifice. For what? To get back some power. It's real. It's real. We don't believe it. We don't understand. It's real. And so the only one who demands blood sacrifices is Satan. Psalm chapter 106, verse 37 through 38. They even sacrifice their sons and daughters to demons. You see that? When you sacrifice something at the altar, you better make sure that it's, it's only to God and not to a demon. But these folks were, were sacrificing their children to the God of Molech, but actually they were really sacrificing their, God, their, their children to a demon. The Bible says it's not me. They sacrificed their sons and daughters to demons. They shed innocent blood. They shed innocent blood, the blood of their sons and daughters, whom they sacrificed to the idols of Canaan. And the land was polluted with blood. Do you know you and I, I was listening to a sermon this morning, you and I are responsible to the destruction that comes to our land? Do you know that you and I not only pollute the land, the earth, the earth can become cursed because of our doings? Hello, God gave Adam and Eve dominion over what? Land, air, and sea. How you doing? How you stewarding your land? Mm -hmm. How you taking care of the being a good steward of God's land? But I'm now I'm talking not just earthly wise. Now I'm going to talk to you spiritually because we're a land unto God. Are we polluting our land? Do we got dead flies in our oil? Hello. I'm not teaching you. I'm not spending time in the Word so I can preach to you so you can leave here and, oh, this felt good, and then leave, and then you forget about it. You've got to get this Word <coughs> in you. You've got to ask the Lord about this. You've got to talk, yes. and you've got to apply it. Where in my life do I need this Word applied yes. so that can overturn? Whatever's wrong can be turned into being right in the name of Jesus. The land was polluted with blood. United States of America, our land is polluted with blood. Millions upon millions of unborn that have been taken through abortion, the level of bloodshed on our land, and we are responsible to give account to it. And when we wonder why our land is the way it is, why we have such devastation, why we have such turmoil, why we got destructive, you know, oh, that's just the one, no. I'm sorry, Mother Nature is groaning. The land is groaning because it's so cursed. That's all I can bring up, a curse on the land. Why, because man has polluted it with what? Bloodshed. I know this is a very tough word, but we got to hear this too. Jeremiah chapter seven, verse 31, I'm almost done. And they have built the high places of Tophet, another god, which is in the valley of the son of Himnam, to burn their sons and their daughters in the fire, which I did not command, nor did it come into my heart. So that doesn't come from God. That comes from, from the realm of darkness. Ezekiel chapter 20, verse 25. Therefore, I also gave them up to statues that were not good and judgments by which they could not live. And I pronounced them unclean because of their ritual gifts. And that they caused all their firstborn to pass through the fire and that I may make them desolate and that they might know that I am the Lord. So our nation is currently at the height of war. In case you didn't know it, we are. While Ukraine and Russia are in literal physical war, we're in spiritual war here yes. in our land. Yep. I'm not sure if you're paying attention to what's happening with the Supreme Court justices right now, because they have to make, it's been brought upon them to make a decision regarding Roe versus Wade. And the climate that surrounds them right now is wicked and it's dangerous. Our job as a church, we should be praying for our Supreme Court justices. We should be sending the fire of the Holy Spirit. We should be asking God for mercy. We should be asking and interceding, Lord, do something with our judges. Show yourself to them. Encounter them, Lord, but turn their hearts to do Amen. what is right in the name yes. of Jesus. Protect them, Lord. Hedge them, Father God, from the wickedness of those that revile and persecute them for the, because of the cause of Roe versus way. Our job is to pray. Amen. What we are seeing in the natural is only an indication of what? the chaos 
and the warfare that's happening in the spirit realm. Since 1973, that's my year, my year, my year, mm -hmm. hey. That's when I was fashioned and fearfully and wonderfully made and birthed out by my mama. <laughs> Road versus way has been an ongoing battle and we have witnessed how legislation has increasingly become more and more wicked and more evil with regards to women's rights and the killing of the unborn. Last month, this church was praying against Bill HBO. Now I'm not talking about media, I'm talking about the movies. It's a bill, HBO 626, which would allow for newborn infants to be killed during the perinatal period of at least 30 days post birth. Imagine that. Imagine that there is genocide, infanticide happening in our nation. We don't have to go to a third world country, it's happening here. Abortion has spread like cancer and has cheapened human life all the way around. Abortion is one of the most senseless acts of violence and evil, killing innocent, unborn babies. It is a terrifying day in our moral decay of society when the popular culture celebrates this great decision and politicians advocate for partial birth and infanticide. All in the name of what? Empowering women. Talk about adultery to the nth degree. When I look at the Bible, the Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 6, it says, love does not delight in evil, but rejoices in truth. There's nothing fun about celebrating death. Unless it was, of course, the death of Jesus Christ, as we know he resurrected and what he was doing for humanity. Celebrating the ending of an innocent human life that God created is not a joke. Celebrating a decision that will likely haunt mothers in the coming days, months, or decades and further increase the moral decay of the nation is not something to laugh about. We know that God is pro-life and we know that the pressured Bible, the book, is pro-life book. Could it be the reason why government has done so much to take it out of schools? to take it out of our government centers, to just destroy it completely so the people are ignorant and does not know what the word of God says. Because if they would find out the word and they would come to truth, they would choose life instead of death. From Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is riddled with scripture of life. Human life is a magnificent thing. There's nothing else like it. Every human being, no matter how small, is fearfully and wonderfully made. Every human being, no matter how disregarded, bears the image of God, the immaculate day of God. Because of their unique stature within the womb, the unborn child remains extremely vulnerable. They have no voice. They cannot protect themselves. So who will be the voice to defend the rights to their life? A Christian call to pro-life action is a call for God's children of light that's us, to be who they are in Christ. Christians who walk in the light must expose darkness. They must expose fruitless works of abortion. That's our responsibility. The murder of unborn children is a dark and barren work, and God calls his people to expose it. As Christians, we must not look away because abortion is a political, moral, and spiritual battle. At its core, abortion is the most heinous of spiritual battles. Abortion is a direct attack on our Lord and creator of life. If we claim to be pro-life but fail to take steps to protect life, we not only deceive ourselves but also deeply grieve our Lord. James 1.22 tells us, be doers of the word and not simply hearers deceiving ourselves. Scripture gives us the standard that God has. Our job is to follow him. So the next time you're at the voting poll, please do not look at which candidate is more likable. Don't bother to look at the red or the blue because it ain't about the elephant and the mule. As a Christian, our job is to vote for biblical principles. Amen. As a Christian, our job is to vote for biblical principles. We are to vote on what God would want. And it's interesting because when, when voting season was here not too long ago, 
I hurt someone and it and it I was like kind of like okay this don't make sense what where's the confusion coming from because the person verbalized and said oh my god the, the elections is going to be so difficult because oh, it's such a tough choice because you know America's so divided half and half and it's like both of both of those that are on the ballot I don't know which one I'm going to choose for and it just it struck me because I'm like, if you're if you're a, a person that believes, if you're a person of faith, if you're a person of the word and of conviction, you're gonna vote for not the red or the blue. You're not gonna vote for who who yeah. likes who. You're gonna vote according to scripture. Easy as pie. What's so difficult about that? Amen. What is difficult about voting for the scriptures? For voting for what is right. For voting for life, because God is life. What is difficult to vote for that? Which candidate stands for righteousness? Which candidate stands for life? Which candidate leans more toward biblical values? That's what we vote. Yes. That is our responsibility. First of all, it's a right as being a citizen of the United States of America, being a citizen of heaven. We have a responsibility to be able to vote for what God wants us to vote for, to vote for life. And we need to make our vote count based on biblical values and biblical principles. Not because of the red mule, the, the blue elephant, or the blue, the blue mule and the red elephant. It's not about society, what they say, who you should vote for, and, and why. It's not about likability or popularity contests. It's about who stands for Christ. Who stands for Christ, that's what I vote. Amen. God's people must do the same for the sake of life. The psalmist reminds us in 100, uh, Psalm 100, verse 3, Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Amen. God bless you. Amen. Let's stand. Let us pray.